Petro. My name is, again, is Maria, and I am here in California, Los Angeles, California, from the other side of the world. My heart and my prayer is for you and your community and your people, so we hope that God will answer our prayer and bring peace to your country. Islam and Muslims are two Arabic words. So uh, the reason why we use Arabic words, because if we want to translate the meaning of Islam and Muslim, it's going to be a few lines, whether it is translated to English or any other language. Both of these words, they come from a one Arabic word that has the three letters, the S and the L and the M. And that word in Arabic without any vowels has two meanings. The first meaning is peace. And the second meaning is to be safe. So a Muslim is a, a person who surrendered to God's will, promoting peace in his personal life and promoting peace to people around. So people will feel always uh, feel safe around that person. So Islam, we're using that word in Arabic because it brings that meaning of uh, surrendering to God's will without an ego, without selfishness, without a personal desire, accepting that we're going to live in peace and we're going to promote peace in this life. So if you um, are familiar with the Quran, in Arabic at least, but in the translation in English will be uh, like um, surrendering to God or submitting to God. The word Muslims comes with every prophet and every community who accepted to surrender to God. The Prophet Muhammad uh, was the final prophet of a series of different prophets. Since the beginning of life, um, a lot of Muslims uh, state that Adam was the first one, Noah was actually the real first one, and then Abraham and all the way to Muhammad. So he was the seal of the prophet, the final one. He did bring the final revelation which is the Quran, but it, in that final revelation, it did confirm the message of every previous prophet before him, specifically the Quran mentioned two major ones, Abra uh, Moses and Jesus, because they are the only two communities who are still alive and still following the tradition of Moses and, and Jesus. So he did not bring a new things to the world, but he, was the final brick of a building that was built by Abraham or probably Noah before him. And then Moses added a few things and then Jesus added more and he was the last brick in that building. It is the final revelation, yes. Um, it brings the same principle that you're gonna find in the Bible, whether you talk about the Torah or the gospels, and um, it was giving to um, a community in the Arabian Peninsula, but it's not only for that community, it's for worldwide religion, bringing the principle of how people should live in this life, peacefully, respectfully, um, promoting justice, uh, and every good things that people can do in this life. Well, um, the most important teaching that came in the Quran is the belief in one God. That's the foundation of Islam. You're probably going to find it almost in every page you read. That's the most important thing to believe in one God. That means that I will not bow to any power except the power of God. And I will not be able to do that until I eliminate my ego and my personal selfishness in order to do that. Um, it is something that I believe also in the Bible to surrender to God. So that's something is uh, emphasis in the Quran. But in order to do that, uh, the believer need to practice certain things, certain ritual that will help them to maintain this belief in their actions, not only in their heart. Because to be a Muslim is not only to believe in one God, is to act upon that belief. So there are a lot of Muslims around the world, but the way they live their life, 
it does not <laughs> align with the message of the Quran. And I feel it's not only Muslims, you're gonna find it in every uh, congregation. People say something, but they believe and they do something different. So uh, the other thing that Muslims uh, will help them to stay on, uh, on track, to stay on the right path, on the straight path, is their five daily prayer which is a personal connection with God that will make them feel like I am bowing to my Lord. I am prostrating all the way down, as you know, on the floor to my God to remind myself that I'm here to serve him. And I'm ready to receive uh, spirituality, strength, wisdom, uh, all these beautiful things. So once I'm done with my prayer, I will be able to manifest this in actions in my community without uh, deceiving the purpose of my life, you know, without deceiving my principle, without abusing the power that God gave me. And that will be by respecting again and promoting justice and peace and um, all these beautiful things that we should work on it. Well, the prayer is the beautiful things. Yeah, I can show you how to do that. But there's two other things that one I can show you, which is my scarf. <laughs> and everybody knows that. And I think I love wearing my uh, scarf. Um, and I'm going to talk about that before I show you how to pray. Because the pr although a lot of women struggle a little bit with the idea of covering their hair because, you know, Women love their look, which I understand, but I love God more than what I love to show my hair outside. But one, one of the things that I love about it is um, my identity. So when I walk down the street, everybody knows that I'm a Muslim. And I feel like this to me makes me the happiest person on earth. Um, I know a lot of people uh, are probably uh, greater than me, better than me. But I feel like if I want to be identified by anybody outside is by being a Muslim. So that's something that I love. As for the prayer, namaz, salat, um, I'm going to show you that. And I hope that you will be able to see me. Yeah. So the first thing that we need to do before we pray is we need to do a ritual things, which is cleaning. So we have a, a good maintaining of hygiene. So we wash face, hands and arms, and then we wash the feet. And we have to do that kind of before we pray. And sometimes we can do it and then do two prayers with the same, as long as we're not using, as they say, the restroom. Uh, the second step is that we need to face toward one direction, which is the city of Mecca. So no matter where we are around the world, this is the city that we have to face. So it's not like north or east, just the city of Mecca, depending on our location. The third thing is that once we start the prayer, this is something a little bit different. We're not able to talk to anybody. So if the phone is ringing, I can't pick up the phone and say, okay, hang on one second, I'm praying, I'll get back to you. Uh, -uh. I am talking to God and I can't be interrupted. When my kids were young, one way to escape from them being annoying is just make a prayer. So once they see me praying, they say, okay, we can't talk to mom. So they will leave the room. That was a nice escape when they were young. Um, this prayer contains um, steps and every step we call it like a cycle. And once we, we do this cycle, the next step is repeating the same cycle. So technically learning one cycle will be repeated 17 times a day. Uh, these five daily uh, uh, prayer have a different number of cycles, but they are always the same. Like for example, the morning prayer is always two cycles and the night prayer is always four cycles. Nobody can add, nobody can eliminate. The difference between the cycle is how much a Muslim memorized from the Quran. So Muslims do pray in the Arabic language, which makes it kind of uh, uh, unified all Muslims around the world. So no matter where we live, 
the prayer will not change. And I travel a lot around the world. It didn't change. I went to a different Islamic centers. The service usually is done in the language of the land, but the prayer is always done in Arabic. So it brings that uh, spirit of unity among Muslims. So the first step is I'm facing towards Mecca and I'm going to raise my hand as a gesture of this is the beginning of my prayer. And I will say in Arabic, Allahu Akbar, God is great. This is the beginning. This is the time when people say, oh, she started the prayer. We're leaving. Okay. The second step is uh, whatever you place your hand, doesn't matter here, there, down. Who cares about that? As long as you're comfortable with your hands. We recite the first opening chapter, the Fatiha, which is similar sometimes in our work with the pastor is we compare the Fatiha to the prayer of Jesus and how all Christian memorize the prayer of Jesus and how Muslims. The second step is we bow down and uh, we say glory to God, the great one. And then we go up. And then we go in the act of prostration where we put the forehead on the ground. And I'm going to be like here on the table, as on the ground. And we say, glory to God, the high ones. We repeat this step of, bow, of prostrating twice. And then we go up and we repeat the same thing again. So that's pretty much the cycle of the prayer. To end the prayer, to conclude at the end, we will be sitting down on the ground and then we repeat a few prayers and then we conclude by turning to the right and saying salam alaikum and turning to the left and say salam alaikum and that means um, the end of the prayer we conclude the prayer and also it means that now since i receive an inspiration since i submitted to god i am ready to spread peace Salam alaikum means peace be unto you. So I am ready to fulfill my mission that God created for me in life to go and spread peace around. That's kind of the summary of the prayer. It depends. Um, the uh, requirement for every prayer is to do one mandated prayer, but we can do extra prayer. Like in the morning, it's two cycle. But I do two before the two. In the noon is four cycle, but I do four before and four after. This is the extra, extra credit, as we say. And it depends on the person and how much the person memorized from the Quran. Like uh, for people who don't speak Arabic, they probably memorize a little uh, of the Quran. So they repeat the same uh, surah over and over and over. And other people uh, memorized more or the entire Quran, so they can read probably two pages in every cycle. That's one fact. The other fact is depending on what are you doing. So I work, uh, I am a chaplain in the jail. So I work with prisoners. I don't have the time to, to read uh, one page in the Quran. So my prayer during the work, no matter who I am, uh, whether you are an engineer, a doctor, a computer, whoever, you don't have the time to read a lot during the day. So the prayer probably will take no more than a few minutes during the day at work. And then you have the morning prayer, which is around like four o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning. This is the time when you have the whole time to pray. So you can make it 15 minutes. So there's no specific time. An average prayer, I would say, an average prayer would be probably between four to six, seven minutes throughout the day. So it's not a, and it, it doesn't have to be at certain time. It always gives you a window of three to four hours to complete your prayer. So like if you're driving or you're a surgeon, you're doing a surgery, you can't, you know, leave the surgery and go and pray. So either you um, bring two prayers together, you can combine prayers, or you can shorten your time and make it fast and quick. Well, one of the things that Muslims say all the time, and um, when I talked about what Islam means, Islam is not a religion that you practice certain hours or in a house of worship. Islam is a way of life. So um, 
one of the things that the Quran talks about it is about seeking knowledge, right? Seeking knowledge is something that we believe is an act of worship. So it's not earthly things to do only to make more money and get better job. Seeking knowledge is like worshiping God because the knowledge that you're going to gain in this life, it will be beneficial to humanity if you use it the right way. So the more you serve people, the more you serve God. So there's no only one thing to worship God through the namaz. Everything that I do, the moment I get up until I go to bed, I am worshiping God. People sometimes ask me, which day of the week is your day of worship? And I say, in the beginning, I didn't understand the question a few years back. I say, we don't have a day. It's seven days. No, 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 no. What day? Oh, you wanted me to say like a Sunday for a Christian and Saturday for, okay, we have Friday, but Friday is not uh, a worship day. Friday is a congregational day, but it's not a worship day because every day is a worship day. No matter what I do in my life, if I am taking care of my students, I am worshiping God. If I am taking care of my clients, I am worshiping God. If I'm taking care of my own kids, I am worshiping God. If I am, no matter what I do, and I do it only for the sake of God and to benefit humanity, I am then worshiping God. So namaz is a personal thing for me to be better in worshiping God when I'm dealing with the society. So it's like a phone. You charge your phone at night so you can use it during the day, right? So we charge ourselves five times a day so we can be more beneficial to humanity. And that's the purpose of the fasting, uh, for the prayer. Every ritual that we do, it should help us to be better as a people in the community. And um, you don't see me praying. You might see me sometimes, but the most important for you as an outsider as a member of the community no matter who you are is not about my prayer it's not about my fasting it's about how i'm dealing with you as an individual as a person and that means a worshiping god i would say the wisdom is that since god is the creator i should not bow to anyone except the creator i should not fear anyone except the creator i should not um put myself first before my mission that we're created for. This is the ultimate wisdom in the Quran, is that we all created from one single source. That means we're all equal in the eyes of God. What makes someone closer to God is what if that person, how that person is closer to humanity, how that person cares more about society, how that person cares more about justice for all. That's the wisdom that I see in the Quran. That's the wisdom that sometimes people do not see it. They label people as uh, religious people based on names, but they forgot the most important essence of the faith. What's the purpose of having faith? It's to bring the best in humanity. It's to help me to cope with my challenges in life so I can never give up and continue on serving the Lord by serving people. Once we reach that level of understanding, you will be, um, you will feel like there's a tranquility in you. You will be content. You will be okay no matter where you are, no matter what challenge you have, because at the end, it's a journey that I'm taking. Sooner or later, I'm gonna die and I will be reunited with my creator and he will hold me and he's the only one who's gonna hold me responsible for my behavior for my deeds it's not people who's gonna judge me if people is gonna judge me i will end up i don't know where <laughs> but i'm so happy that we all believe in one god and he's the only one who's the most merciful most forgiving who will judge each one of us based on his principle not based on people principle and that's the ultimate wisdom that we should see and that's what the quran talks about What's the right way to follow the prophet? Okay. Um, 
Number one, we should know the prophet. We can't follow anybody if we don't know anything about that person. And uh, we're very lucky to have so many books about uh, his life. And um, when we study his life and we learn, we should follow them. I would say as a for me, I understood a lot of things about his life. I studied his life. I was teaching his life for so many years. To grasp everything, it's really hard. But there's a verse in the Quran where it talks about the moral, moral of the, the prophet. It is not about how many times he pray. It's not about how he memorized the Quran. It's about how he lived as a humble person in the community and how his moral kept him uh, the way he is. Um, so following him is doing one thing. Whatever you believe in, you have to act upon it. Uh, don't do things that you don't believe in them. Don't do things they contradict with your preaching because a lot of people talk about things, but they don't do it. Like people talk about, give lecture about honesty, about uh, kindness, about compassion. But when you look at their actions, they're completely different. He was kind with women. He was kind with his enemy. He was kind with um, the elderly. He was uh, nice to the children. But he was firm and tough when he needed to be tough. So we have to un learn from him that when I need to be a human, which is mo most of my time, I have to be with these quality. But at the same time, I am not an easy person that people can take advantage of me or take my rights to believe in whatever I want to believe. So I have to show when I need to show toughness without being disrespectful, but I'm tough. And the people sometimes call me here, I'm the iron woman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a tough lady, but at the same time, I'm an easygoing when it comes to life in general. I am tough when it comes to faith. I'm so proud of my faith. I will not compromise with my faith. I will not lean when it comes to my faith. But when it comes to life with people, oh, I'm easygoing because I want people to be happy. I want people to be able to talk to me, to ask me questions, to be close to me. So I don't need to be tough with them in that matter. But if people kind of sometimes want me to compromise and be easy in my faith, no. Like a lot of people, I can give you an example. A lot of people after 9-11 did ask me, uh, would I be continuing wearing the scarf or not? Because now everybody knows that I'm a Muslim. And I said, I'm not changing. I'm not changing. It doesn't matter what happened. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> I am not changing uh, anything about my faith. I'm more proud of my faith, more practicing. So when it comes to faith, I'm strong, as he was strong. But when it comes to dealing with people, I try to compromise as much as I can, because he did compromise a lot with people, just to, to get to uh, midway between them. Well, for me to be a Muslim is to understand what it means. As I mentioned earlier, to submit, to surrender to God's will, to have this peaceful life in me for myself and promote peace and making people feel safe uh, when they are around me. Um, years back when my uh, middle son, uh, middle child got uh, his driver license, he was um, 17 and a half. Um, we went to the the school, the driving uh, place, and he passed the test and he came back. He said, my mom, I have my driver license. I passed the test. Hey, hallelujah. Perfect. What are you going to do? He said, I'm going to drive you back home. I said, I know you're going to do that, but what are you going to do with it? He said, what do you mean? I'm going to put it in my pocket, in my wallet, and I'm going to drive. And I said, no, no, that's not what I meant. How are you going to do in driving? He said, what do you mean? I said, Okay, let me give it to you. How are you going to practice your faith with this? He said, even this, you bring faith? I said, yeah, even this, I bring faith to it. He said, what do you mean? I said, did you sign your name when you got the, your driver license? He said, yes. I said, that means, number one, you know, you're going to obey the law. And chapter five, the beginning of it, God says, oh, you believe, fulfill your contract. 
So it doesn't matter who is behind that contract. Since you put your name down, that means you're going to abide the law. No speed, because speed means that people are going to be scared when they're driving around you. And you're a Muslim. You can't do that. People need to feel safe. So you're going to... So that's what it means to be a Muslim. It's you bring it in every aspect of your life. You're going to be honest. You're going to, you know, ensure that people feel that these value that you carry in your life. So that's what it means to be a Muslim. Oh, what is the true Islam? It's just to surrender. It's to surrender your will to God with a knowledge and a free will, meaning that I can impose Islam on anybody. It's against the teaching of the Quran. I can't force people to practice against the teaching of the Quran. But at the same time, you're not going to be able to practice if you don't have knowledge and a free will. You have to have both together in order to follow the teaching of the Quran and, and being a Muslim. Well, for centuries, a lot of people have wrong idea about women in Islam. As a woman and as a public speaker, I've been giving tons of presentations about women, right? Uh, I came to a time I feel like I'm done. I don't want to talk about women in Islam because you keep bringing this subject and Go educate yourself sometimes to people, especially to Muslims sometimes. I say, like, go educate yourself because you keep to asking me questions. And it's the Quran talks about these kind of things. You, you read the Quran, but you don't understand it. And I feel so bad because uh, the West got a wrong idea about women in Islam based on the ignorance of women in Islam. Many women are, don't know anything about their rights. Many women are abused by their own communities. I have been teaching in California for 30 years, and I'm still struggling with my own community when it comes to that topic, that women don't know their rights. So this is where I felt like there is a need to be to educate because for centuries, since the beginning of, of the message of the prophets until today, most of the scholars are male. Most of people who wrote books are male. Where is the woman? Why the woman is not speaking? Why is not writing? So I became the, <clears throat> the voice of women for many years here in California, teaching my women about their rights and their, how God put them in a very high position, how they have to understand their rights so no one will abuse them and no one will take advantage of them. In the teaching of the Quran and in the teaching of the messenger himself, we have two things that we need to understand. Women and men in this life, they're not 100% equal and they will never be 100% equal. And I don't want to be equal to my husband because it's not going to happen. But I have rights as he has rights. Um, we complete each other and we're not competing against each other. What God gave me, things, he didn't give it to him. And what he gave him, things, he didn't give it to me because I need the thing that God gave me. I don't need the thing that God gave him. But he gave me and gave me the same thing. We have the same brain. We have the same soul. Okay. We have the same ritual that we need to practice. But it's still, we have different things to do. Okay. So we complete each other and we're not here to compete. There are probably certain things that Muslim women don't do, okay, and Muslim men don't do. Or people do ask me, so can you be a, an imam? I said, well, my title in the jail is Imam Maria. An imam means a leader. I understand that I cannot lead a congregation of men and women. I don't want to lead a congregation in prayer. But I want to lead the congregation in words and actions. And I can do that anytime and anywhere in the mosque and outside of the mosque. You don't need to lead a prayer in order to be a leader. You need to lead a, uh, a community by being an example, 
by being somebody that people look up to you. And in my work, I have 500 guys that they come and attend my classes. I try to empower them. I speak to men and women. I attend meetings like men and women. I lead a lot of stuff like men and other men and other women around the world. So women in Islam, they need to understand that I don't want to be equal to my husband and I will never be equal to my husband because we have different things to do in this life. And I'm proud to be a woman. It's God's will. So I can, you know, <laughs> argue with that. But it's being a woman it doesn't make me different than being a man because the, at the end, I have a mission. And my mission is to serve my community, men and women equally to be the best that I can be. Um, again, I love my scarf and I wear it uh, proudly every day. It does not make me less opposite, makes me proud and I'm very content with that. And uh, women sometimes have issues and I feel like we need to tackle two things. Number one, how strong you are in your faith. And number two, how strong you believe in yourself. If you're not uh, confident in yourself, it doesn't matter who you are. And it's so important to be confident and to feel like, I love who I am. I'm proud for who I am. And that the most important things, to have that feeling in you. And uh, being a Muslim woman, I am I'm, I'm proud. Muslim, I'm proud to be a woman. I'm proud to be a mother. I'm proud to be a wife. I'm proud to be a sister and a daughter. I'm, I'm okay. I mean, you covered a good chunk of the thing. I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for um, having this Zoom with me. Thank you so much. And I, um, I ask the Lord to bless you in your work and continue to do that. If anything that I can help in the future, you have my contact. If you need more people, I can connect you with other people. I don't have anything to add except I'm so proud of your work.